I don't know how long it is since I've had a haircut, but it's a long time. And I'm having to resort to wearing my wife's scrunchies in public. And I may even have to resort to wearing a safari hat indoors. And today I'm doing something else that I never thought I would do. I'm going to look at this diminutive Canon M50, my vlogging camera, as a potential mirrorless camera to use for wildlife and safari photography attached to big EF lenses like this 100 to 400 Mark II and my 400 2.8 4 kilogram lens. It's going to be exciting. I don't want to waffle on too long about this camera. There's a blog post linked below for all of the details and my thinking about this combination. I just want to give you a general idea or gist of what I feel about this camera from a wildlife photography perspective. So let's talk about the specs. And if we think about the specs, they're actually not too bad. It's got a 24 megapixel sensor, a fairly modern one. It's got an APS-C size sensor, so a reasonably big one. It's not micro four thirds or anything like that. It's got 10 frames per second continuous shooting. It's got a buffer depth with a RAW for, of 10 frames and 33 for JPEG. And it's got something crucial. It's got servo autofocus. That's crucial because when subjects or animals move through the frame, the camera can track them between shots. So if you've got a running springbok or a gazelle or a moose or something, you can track it and photograph it and that autofocus will adjust itself to where that animal is as it moves through your frame. The downside is the buffer. The buffer is not big enough for raw format, but it's not a train smash as they say in South Africa because it's got a 33 shot buffer in JPEG. So if you've got a bird perch in a tree, it's about to take flight, I would seriously consider just for that purpose moving to a JPEG and taking 33 shots of it at 7.4 frames a second, you're bound to get something nice rather than one second or less of RAW and you won't get anything. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what is that idiot doing attaching that lens to this camera? It's not made for it. It's not a mirrorless lens. But if I can quote George Mallory when he was asked why he wanted to climb Everest, it's because it's there and I haven't got much else to do at the moment. And I thought, why not try it? Why not try it with some severely good optics and see what results? But it's probably a better option from an ergonomic standpoint to stick with the EFM lenses. I think the maximum focal length on them is 250 millimeters. It's a little bit short, but you could try and go longer with a 70 to 300, uh, an EFS lens if you wanted, or, if you really wanted to push the boat out, something light like a Canon 400 5.6 might be a good option. Because what's interesting about this little M50 is it is probably the only type of camera, the camera format that Canon makes that can take EF lenses, EFS lenses and EFM lenses. In fact, I know it's the only format that can do that. What a great versatile option to be able to attach pretty much anything to this camera except the RF format. So that's the camera on paper. We've got to talk about what it's like in fact though. Now I don't have any problem with the image quality. I don't have any problem whatsoever. It's perfectly good enough. I don't have any problem with the frame rate. It's not compromised enough to make it not viable. So that brings me to my first difficulty with this camera as a wildlife shooter. It's size. It's not because it's too big and clunky. It's because it's too small and petite. Look how much, I don't know if you can see, look how much the bottom half of my hand, my right hand is hanging off this camera. I've got hardly a grip on it. And when I consider that that camera is bearing the weight of this heavy chunky lens, and this is only my smaller telephoto, then I've got a problem, particularly if I add this EF to EFM adapter into the situation because I've got a point of stress here on the body and I've got another point of stress here at the edge of the, edge of the lens. And if I hold it on the right hand side of the camera on the grip, I can, but I don't like it. It feels very 
adventurous and even more adventurous when I get the big four kilogram f2.8 out. Very adventurous indeed. So the basic ergonomics of this camera are not working in its favor. And if I dig a little deeper into that, it's also not working in its favor when I consider how I can use the buttons on this. I like to use back button focus. And to do that, I can set up these two buttons on the back of the camera and they work fine. The problem is I'm trying to reach my thumb over to actually do and use this back button here to focus. And it's a strain. I've got cramp developing in my index finger in the back of my palm and the hand. And it's just too small. I need a bigger, chunkier body so that I can get my thumb to the buttons. And then what about down here? How do you get down to this little dial? It's virtually impossible without some kind of manic contortion. Another problem I discovered with the camera was moving the focus points. And when you're using the multifunction controller to do that, the point moves very slowly across the screen and sort of jumps like this. And it's too slow. So using touch and drag on the screen is much more effective. And if you hold a camera like this, you can use your thumb to drag the focus point around like a mouse on a computer. The difficulty I know some people have is their nose rubs on it and it moves the focus point. You're gonna to have to learn how to deal with that, I think, because it's a much better way of moving the focus point on this body. And the other issue is if you use back button focus because your thumb is now placed here and not on the back button for focusing, it's going to become problematic. You can leave this button set up for back button focus, move your focus point, and then use it. But if the subject then moves around the frame, you're gonna to have to take your thumb off and you might lose the shot. So my suggestion would be for this kind of body, enable touch and drag, disable back button focus, put the focus back on the shutter button, which is the standard way of doing it anyway, and use the camera in that configuration. You'll get used to it. Where I did think I might have a problem was with the autofocus, uh, because typically mirrorless cameras are not generally as good as their cousins, the DSLR. And I discovered this during my review of the Olympus OMD uh, EM1 Mark II, quite a high-end mirrorless camera at that time. And where they struggle is with subjects coming directly towards you at speed. So I decided to do that with this M50 with my dog Flash as the subject. And Flash did challenge the auto focus functions. But having played with a few settings on this camera and trying a game this morning, I actually decided that the autofocus is okay. It's fine for tracking fast moving subjects coming directly towards you to within about five meters or so. And then it starts to lose it. But it's not just the autofocus that's losing it. It's actually the refresh rate in the viewfinder. You can't physically track and correct for the bounding motion or the fast moving motion of that dog in three dimensions quick enough because the refresh rate or your view through the viewfinder is not actually accurate. It's not the same as what's actually being seen by the camera's autofocus out there in front of it. The refresh rate is too slow in here, so your movements are behind the curve, if that makes sense. And that gets worse and worse as the subject approaches you. So the autofocus system is okay, but only as good as the corrections that you make when looking through the EVF. So that combination of factors tends to work to the detriment of the photograph. Now, having said that, in Africa, we have a lot of mammal species and the only ones that run directly towards us are the ones that are trying to eat us. And that thankfully doesn't happen that often. Normally they run at tangents or parallels and you have to track the motion like this, basically in arcs. And that kind of shooting for mammals is entirely within the capabilities of this M50. I don't think it will struggle too badly with that. I think there are better cameras out there, but this will actually do the job, which is great for a camera costing this much. The camera probably will suffer though when you're trying to photograph smaller subjects like birds, birds in flight, and any birds coming directly towards you, which can happen. 
And the reason that happens is because typically we'd place ourselves upwind in a takeoff path and the bird would fly towards us in order to get lift to get off the ground. And as that bird approaches and becomes bigger and bigger in the frame, this camera is going to struggle more and more. So in African conditions where we photograph large mammals and birds, we have a plethora of subjects to photograph, we can get away with using this camera. You'll have to make up your own mind in your own area or environment whether this camera is going to do the job because for smaller mammals, fast moving mammals and small birds, this camera's autofocus is going to be an exercise in frustration. So think about it. Is it going to work for you? Let's talk about some of the positive things related to this camera. One of them, I think, is the electronic viewfinder. It's nice to have that on a mirrorless camera. Some mirrorless cameras are getting rid of them at the cheaper levels, but this one has one and I like it. I like it because it's really useful for video and I also like it because if you're a novice, you can uh, judge exposure and see settings in there that you can't do with an optical viewfinder. Having said that, I don't generally like electronic viewfinders because there's a cost to using them. And the cost is a crunchy, uh, squashed dynamic range image. You get dark shadows and bright highlights and it doesn't look the same as it does through an optical finder, which is fine if it's a portrait shoot or you're shooting a picture of a mouse or a pen or something. It's okay, you can live with that because that's what it's going to look like when you take the picture of it. But when you're looking at a beautiful leopard in a tree and it's backlit and the sky is gorgeous and bright and that's what it looks like through your eye and then you pick the camera up and you point it at it and it looks like a squashed mess, that detracts from the wildlife experience. And after all, the photograph is only one tiny part of that overall experience. I've already talked about the touch and drag autofocus, but the other things that are nice on this camera, one of the other things that are nice on the camera is the flip out screen. This is really useful. It's so nice to finally have one in, uh, in a Canon body, you know, with a reasonable camera attached, because what you can do is you can place this close to the ground, flip this screen up and take gorgeous shots of things like flowers, and bugs and ants and any kind of macro that's close to the ground. And it's not easy always to contort into those positions or even get yourself in the position to be able to look through a viewfinder. So we'd have to resort to maybe using Wi-Fi on a phone to take the shot. Now you can stand in a different position and look into the viewfinder, look into the, the touch screen here and get shots that you don't wouldn't be able to do before. So that's a good thing. Then the buttons can all be remapped. That's another good thing. And one of the best things about this is also the focus frame width. The frame width of mirrorless cameras is much bigger generally than DSLRs. So the focus points on this camera, there's 149 of them with certain lenses and 99 with other lenses. Those focus points stretch across 88% of the frame, which is pretty vast compared to older DSLRs. And that's nice because you can focus on things on the edges of the frame and you won't have to focus and recompose like we used to do in the old days. Okay, let's get down to it. Do I recommend the Canon M50 as a wildlife camera? Well, the answer to that question is in two parts and it's a lot to do with you. Do you see yourself traveling with this camera, using it at your local pond to photograph wildfowl, photograph your family, photograph lots of different things and wildlife, then I think this camera can do the job. If you're going to use this camera as a second body and then use it for vlogging and video, this camera can do the job. If you're going to use it for bird photography, this camera kind of can do the job. But the next part of this question is, where do you see yourself going in wildlife photography. If, you're, if it's something you want to take on and improve and take seriously, then I think there's probably better options out there than this camera. I think this camera will hold you back if that's your passion. And I wouldn't advise buying it if that's you. If you want to get something that's more appropriate for wildlife photography, stills photography, 
Forget about video for the moment because this camera is a very good video camera. Think about second-hand cameras because you can get great bodies for around the same price as this. And I can prove it because I found the other day a Canon 1D Mark IV, a 1 Series Pro body with two batteries, which is important because they don't make those batteries uh, anymore. Third parties make them. You can get a Canon 1D Mark IV for the same price as this camera. And if you want to take wildlife photography, stills photography seriously, that Canon 1D Mark IV is a far better option. In fact, it's a fantastic option for the same price as this little M50.